first Sunday of a new year. And pastors always have this Sunday, first Sunday of the year, either kicking off a new series or, or give you a, a pep talk or give you things like New Year's resolutions and stuff like that. I'm going to do that today. <laughs> I'm going to do that. You see, there's a turning. There, there, there's this turning in the church. I don't know if you've noticed it. I don't know if you've noticed how things are kind of turning, especially in our church. And I, I hope it's in your life. You know how sometimes you go through hard and difficult times and it seems like forever and you can kind of identify with Paul when he talks about, look, I know what it means to not have anything. I know what it means to be beat up. I know what it means to get trampled on. I, you know, those scriptures are there. And Paul says, I know what that means. I know what it means to feel like I'm serving God and I get no results. I know what it means to feel like I'm being punished by God. You ever feel that way? Some of you are going through it right now. Some of you, God is disciplining. Some of you, God is training. Some of you, God is simply guiding your life, and it feels awful. <laughs> it's no fun. It's no fun. Believe me, I understand. I've been here for 22 years with a dream. 23 years ago, Robin and I prayed. Well, I did. I don't know if she did, but I prayed. <laughs> that God would give us a city right outside of a major city that serves as sort of like a, a springboard that has people that has the heart of God that wants to impact the world. Mm -hmm. He brought us to Goodyear. Amen. 22 years ago. You'd think, man, we'd be popping by now. Oh, but we've had our tough times. We've had struggles. I would love to say to you that I'm one of these kind of guys that everything I touch turns to gold. But I'm kind of one of these guys that everything I touch doesn't move. <laughs> I just touch it. It's God that's got to do it. That's right. And it's God's timing that it's got to happen. Yes, Not you, Gene. Not anything. You see, God has took me through this time of training and teaching and guiding. And, oh, we've seen wonderful things happen in our church throughout the last 22 years. Amazing things that have happened. Lives being changed. God bringing people here. They get touched and they, God transformed their lives. And then some of them stay, some of them move on. And that's okay. That's okay. We've seen good times financially. We've seen horrible times financially. We've seen wonderful ministries, and we've seen things not go so well. You see, everybody goes through it because there's this time. It's God's time. And then there's this time when he says, I want you to believe me because I'm turning things. I'm turning things into your favor. I've prayed. I sought God about 2014. Man, I'm getting old. 2014. I didn't think I'd ever see 2014. But I prayed and I asked God, Lord, show us as a church what we need to do in 2014. Show us what we need to do. And I, I don't know if it's just me. I don't think that it is. But deep in my spirit, I discern that 2014 is the year of promise. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that the year that those dreams, those hopes, the promises of God, they begin to unfold in your life. I believe that. I believe that it's, it's going to be the most exciting year this church has ever had. It's going to be the most exciting year I've ever lived. 
Why I know that? Because I sense it in my spirit and I believe it and I am sharing it today. That's where it starts. So if you're going through a tough time today, if you feel like giving up, if you want to quit, don't. You can want to quit, but don't quit. Understand me? Hope is on the way. And it's really going to help you with what I believe God has given my heart today to share with you the next few moments. (laughs) This is the year of beginning. 23 years ago, I prayed God would give us this place, and he did. I never thought it would take as long as it is now. But I can say all of this this morning because I have been here, and I've seen it, and I have never felt such a warm, loving spirit as I do in this church right now. Roger and Sherry, you're here. They used to wave at us. They used to come, what, about 20 years ago? Oh, come on, come on. They're snowbirds now, so they're just kind of flying through. But it's good to see you. But I, honestly, I've never felt a spirit like I feel in this church now. You guys rock. <laughs> Some of you look like me like, I don't rock. You're awesome. God is doing stuff. Yesterday at our men's prayer breakfast, I was touched deeply by all 26 men who attended. I remember when we couldn't get four out. Okay? God's Spirit was moving. Sunday before Christmas, let me draw this to your attention. As I watched and as I prayed for the men of this church at the front of this altar, I knew something was up. Because there was more men than women that day in the building. Did you notice that? God is moving our men. They're ready. Now, not to doubt all the wonderful godly ladies. We love you. But when men allow God to move in their lives, look out. And they're allowing it. And with all that being said, what's next? What do we do? And again, I prayed and I sought the Lord, and He's deeply put three things on my, my, my heart, three priorities, three focuses that we're going to really take care of this year in our church. Three things that we're going to lift up. They're already going. They're already doing well. But I believe that these three things are the springboard to an amazing revival. And let me just share those before I get right into the heart of the Word of God. These are the three areas that we're going to prioritize this year at West Valley Church. Number one, we will enhance giving. I have a dream, and that dream is this church will give away more than we keep for ourselves. Give away more than we keep for ourselves. If that's 51%, that's 51%. But you know what I'd really like to see? 90%. I'd like for this church to learn to live on the tithe. 10%. The Bible says if you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full measure. Pressed down, shaken together, making room for more and running over. Well, listen to this. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will use, be used to measure what is given back to you. So to what measure do you want to be blessed? To what measure do we want our church to be blessed? And these blessings are not just about money. It's about spiritual renewal, revival. <laughs> giving first releases God's Promise is about faith. Now you need to understand we off the top of every offering at West Valley tithe. We tithe to our missionaries and to our district office. And it will be so. Whether we can pay the mortgage or not, we're going to tithe. 
Whether we can pay the electric bill, we may be having services in the dark. Whether we can do that or not, we can, we're going to tithe. Amen. We won't have services in the dark because God honors. Second priority, we will empower the next generation. This one is really heavy on my heart. We're going to really empower the next generation. And I'm talking about our children. I'm talking about our babies. I'm talking about our youth. I'm talking about our young adults. Yeah. We're going to empower them. Listen to the Word of God. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your Word. Mm -hmm. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You want to know how to get your kids started off right in life? Put the word of God in their heart. You want to know how to keep them from rebelling? You want to know how to keep them from falling away to the point where you don't see them again? Get the word in their heart. Because the Bible says you do that, he will bring them back. Amen. They won't wander too far. Robin and I want to offer what we know about parents, parenting, to parents to empower, to empower their children. We've not been the most perfect parents, absolutely not. We've made lots of mistakes. We really have. But I know God has been faithful. I know our kids have not wandered too, off, too far off the path. God has brought them back, and they're all in ministry today, Amen. every one of them. They are married to godly spouses with godly families. What an amazing thing. Yes. And you know what I can really attribute that to? The Word of God in their heart. Amen. I read a quote the other day. It says, only empowered people can reach their potential. Priority number three this year, we will encourage leadership. Second Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, look, what I have taught you, you teach some, to someone else so that they can teach to someone else. Empower them. This takes education, dedication, and involvement. We're going to work at presenting ways that you can grow. You see, God has brought you to West Valley Church. I haven't brought you here. He's brought you here to grow. He's brought you here because you have something to offer, because you can make a difference in someone's life. And we want to help you learn how you can do that. Be a part of something bigger than yourself. Oh, we want to show you how to do that. Or help you, guide you. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We want to give you the knowledge that we have. And the Holy Spirit will do the rest. You see, if we do these three things, God promises us a future that will affect you, your family, for generations to come. It's not about you. It's about your children your children's children, your children's 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 children. You get my drift, children's children. It's about generations. Your decisions today, this year, are going to impact your family line for generations. Now you can look at that and say, oh boy, what pressure. Or you can look at that and say, praise God, I'm going to impact them with the Word of God. So we're going to help you do that this year. Those are our three priorities. Is that too difficult? You're going to see some changes. These priorities are simply a springboard to help you grow. We've got some improving to do, and we're going to do that. Be patient with us, but we'll get there. You see, there are thousands of promises in God's Word. Thousands. I've heard it say up to 8,000 promises in God's Word for you and for me that we are to act on and receive. And some are specific for a, a certain time. Many years ago, God gave me two portions of scriptures that I preach on often, that I say a lot, because it's a promise for this church, for this future of this church. And here they are, Psalm 112 and, Psalm, and Isaiah 54. 
Two chapters, two short ones. They're promises that God gave me concerning this church years ago for the future. And I've stood on them. And if God has called you to West Valley Church, these promises are for you and for your family. So read them. This morning, for a few moments, I want to go back and I want you to, I want to review Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54 is an amazing portion of Scripture. Israel had turned from God and God had to punish them and they were in bondage. <laughs> but God kept His promise because God told them, I'm going to discipline you, but I will bring you out. There's always a turning point. God promises His love and mercy in Isaiah 54. He promises the new city that they're going to live in. It was all laid out there. There was a turning point. He starts off saying some great things. Praise me. Expand. <laughs> Have faith. And then he's a little segment. He, st he stops and says, look, for a little while, I punished you. I disciplined you. I trained you for a little while. But that time is over. Now there's this turning point that's coming. And I'm going to turn it all around. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to let your, the promises come true that you have been waiting for. And 2014 is that year, church. Now I want to look at these promises. Verses 5 and 6 says that we have been prepared for this time. Verses 7 and 9 says God has God uh, promises God's restoring compassion and healing. Verses 10 and 11, this promise is God's covenant of peace. Verses 12, you have a prosperous future ahead of you. Verse 13, which is one I love, your children will be taught by the Lord. You don't get excited about that? Your children, God will come down and teach your children. Hallelujah. Uh, that's powerful. Verse 14, you'll have a righteous foundation. Verse 14 again, no oppression will come upon you. There will be financial freedom. Praise God. Someone say amen to that amen. one. No more avoiding phone calls because you don't want to pick it up because you owe money. Praise God. <laughs> Verses 15 through 17, God's protection from evil weapons. Man, if that doesn't sound, does that sound like you, the way you want to live? That's just in Isaiah 54, those promises right there. And you can probably find more of them in there. The Bible says in verse 17 there, this is the heritage of of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. That's what you've got to say. That's my promise. That's your promise. How do we live in these promises? What do we do? I want you to back up and I want to look at the first four verses. The first four verses says it all. Now remember, this is what's coming but notice that God tells them how to act. God tells them the actions to take in order to see these promises fulfilled. You've got dreams. You've got visions. You've got promises God has laid in your heart. You've got things that you want to do, things that you've seen, things that you'd love to accomplish, and God has put in your heart to do. Church, here's the three things that you need to do to make that come alive in 2014. Number one, live and give hope. Live and give hope. Look what he says. Sing. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of 
her who is married, says the Lord. You who have all these dreams and have all this, these, these hopes in your life, you that, that want to accomplish so much and you, you've got these things that you'd love to do, you that, that you say, well, I've, I've got them in here, I, I, but I can't bring them out. He says, sing, have hope, and give hope. Singing implies a positive spirit and attitude. It changes the atmosphere around you. See, here's the deal. We often want to see things happen before we change our attitude. But God says, no, I want you to change your attitude before things happen. You see... You see, we have it all in reverse, and that's why he says at the beginning, you want these promises? Then I want you to sing. I want you to change the way you, you, you think. I want you to be hopeful. I want you to give hope. I want you to speak life. I want you to do what is right. A positive attitude releases the favor of God and releases his promises upon us. Do you bless your kids when they run around the house griping and complaining all day? If you do, you're not a, I don't know if you're a good parent or not. Do you bless your kids if they're just griping and spewing out nasty stuff with their mouth? No. No. But you do bless them when, when they have a smile on their face, when they, 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 they just have a pleasant spirit. You want to do that. You see, negativity limits God. And when you speak negative... When you don't have any hope, when you don't give hope, it limits God. God says, turn that around. I want you to speak low hope. I want you to speak life. I, I pray this prayer every day. I found it in Scripture, and I've prayed it ever since. Most of the time it works. Unfortunately, sometimes I break it open, and it doesn't work. But it says this, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. You know what I mean? That is so hard to do. Man, you just want to say what's on your mind. You just want to say it. But if you pray this prayer, I tell you, God will help you. God will help you to watch what you say. Number two, a second thing that I learned in the scripture, if you want to turn it around, think radically big. That's your blank. Think radically big. Not just big. No, big, huge, audacious, crazy. Think that. Look what it says. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will, and, and will people the desolate, desolate cities. <laughs> now, you, you look at that and you say, well, well, I don't want my kids to leave me. No, no, let's look at this and apply it to where we are. This is not just talking about brick and mortar. Care less about that stuff. It's about your spiritual growth and change Changing as a family. Strengthen your stake. The Bible says, may you grow deeper and stronger in love. It's about dreaming. It's about planning. It's about not limiting God. See, so often we limit God by our small thinking. We settle for less than what God wants. I'm reading through the Bible again. I finished up Wednesday. I'm reading through it again. Going through Genesis. And you know, I come across the part where Abraham, Abraham is, is with his father Terah. They set out, his father Terah sets out to Canaan. Okay? He was the origination, original of that, origin, the origination of that came from him. He planned it, I'm going to go to Canaan, Abraham's father. But then I, as I read, I, I study, I, I learn that he stopped short. He stopped short of the promised land. You know, 
Canaan is what we know now as the promised land. And he stopped in Haran. The Bible says, but when he came to Haran, he settled there. Now, that, those words just hit me. He settled there. How often do we have dreams? Do we have visions? Do we have a plan that we would love to accomplish things in our life? And we, 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 even, we even know what we love to do, and we start off there, but then we stop in Haran. We settle. We settle. If you are living and breathing today, I don't care if you're 115. I don't care. If you have dreams, you can still accomplish them. You can still do it. Don't settle. Don't settle for status quo. Don't settle where you are now. God is huge God. God has huge plans. God is a big God. You need to dream big. You need to plan big. You need to think big. You need to have a big vision. You need to open up your heart and say, yes, we can with God. Think radically big with your life. Personalize this. Why are you choosing to think small about your abilities? Why are you choosing to think small about your purpose? Why are you settling? Why do we put boundaries around what God can do in our families and in our lives? What if God has called your son or your daughter to be an ambassador on a mission field? What if he's called to be the next Billy Graham? Think radically big. What if God wants you to prosper financially to the point where you are free to serve wherever and whenever you want and God leads? Uh, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, there we go. See how Satan always intercepts a, an excited plan? He comes in and throws all the, the negative stuff in there. Don't think of those things. The Bible says expand your thinking. Think big of what God wants you to do. I was visiting with some of the guys after the breakfast yesterday out, out here telling them the possibilities. I love to look at the possibilities. The possibilities of what God can do with this church right here. Do you want to hear some of those possibilities? That, that I, I mean, I don't know if this is what God wants. I, I've got several options, but this is one of the things that he, he's put in my heart. You see, you know, first of all, we're going to knock down that old building. Don't worry. And it's going to be a gymnasium, and it's going to be beautiful. But you know what? You're going across, and you see this open field next door here. Big open field. God's preserving it for us. You understand what I'm saying? Right here on the freeway. And you know what? We used to, many years ago, not we, this church owned all the property where those apartments are. They owned it. That was before my time. It was sold before I got here, okay? But... I watched them build these apartments. And you know what the first thought hit me? God, I could use those apartments, every one of them. I could use those apartments. I can see, you know, uh, single moms that we're helping. I, I can see people being discipled that are there. I can see missionaries and, and tired pastors coming and, and just having a place to stay. I'm sharing this with you to blow your mind because you need to think in your own life and blow your mind. We're limiting God. Amen. We're limiting God with our thinking. We need to expand it. He says, enlarge. Mm -hmm. Don't think, little bitty. Enlarge. I mentioned to some of you sometimes about going on mission trips. Well, I don't know if I can ever go. Well, you have that attitude, you won't go. Okay? Dream about it. Dream about going to China. Dream about going to, yeah, Pam's always wanting to go. Dream about going to Africa. Dream about going to Brazil. Dream about helping us. Dream about what God wants to do with you, not just in your own little town, but in the nation, around the world. Dream big. Because it's turning. Are you going to get with the turn, or are you going to stay back in Haran? Get with the turn. Move forward. The Bible says, yes. Jesus says, yes, ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
If you love me, obey my commandments. Now, we read that and we're like, well, I don't know. I've asked a lot of things and he hadn't done it. You don't take it out of context. First of all, obey his commandments. Okay? First of all, get your life lined up with him. And when you do that, you will pray correctly. He doesn't say, I'm a genie in a bottle, just rub me and I'll come out and give you whatever you want. He's saying, look, if you line your life up with me, if you find your purpose and you begin to go down this life, he says, and you connect with my spirit, you will pray right and whatever you ask, I will give to you. Loving God and obeying him gives you a view of the big picture and what it's all about. Number three, the last one. Oh, we want to see if this turn happen. Ch charge, charge with courage. I use the word charge on purpose because sometimes we kind of walk backwards in courage. Sometimes we kind of just, that's not courage. Charge in courage. Have courage. The Bible says, fear not. I want to say that again. Fear not. That doesn't mean fear a little bit. It's okay to fear. I can justify my... No, fear not. For you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will n remember no more. He's, pre he's, talking this to, he's speaking to Israel here, which he looks at as his bride. <laughs> he's talking to you and I, which were the bride of Christ. He says, all the mistakes you ever made, <laughs> all the things that you've done, guess what? It's turning. Fear not. You see, here's the deal. When we get outside of God's will, and maybe we make a few mistakes, maybe we do some stupid things with our lives that don't make a bit of sense, maybe we do that. What happens is that often Satan, we come back to the Lord, and we give our lives back to Him, and everything is pretty good, but yet in the back of your mind, Satan's holding that over on you. And he's saying, you know what? You don't need to make any of these decisions because you'll fail again. You know what? You don't need to dream big because they're not going to come true because you're such a bad person. You, you know what? You, you, you don't need, and you, don't, you can say all you want, but it puts doubt in your heart. Even though you come back to Jesus, even though you, you, he forgives you, and you know he forgives you, he restores you, and you hear all the messages about that, there's still something back there that says, you're going to fail. Remember what happened when you were younger? Remember? This scripture says you will forget the shame of, of your mistakes. You will forget the mess ups. You won't have to look at those anymore. <laughs> you don't have to remember them anymore. What an amazing God we have. What an amazing Father we have. Because He doesn't restore halfway, He restores all the way. He cleans your mind. He cleans your heart. He gives you a new heart, a new mind. He sets you free. So this, knowing this is why you can say, okay, I know where God wants me. I know what's in my heart. I'm not going to walk to it. I'm going to charge. I'm going to go with courage, knowing that he is with me. I'm reading the Bible through again, as I mentioned earlier, and I came across the story of Noah. Noah, what a story. I love this guy. He was a man of courage, okay? Now, you know, we, we think of Noah, Noah, we think of some weird guy off in the woods somewhere probably. I don't know. But you don't think that he's a warrior. You don't really look at that. You think, well, maybe he's just a builder. Maybe he's just, well, he's just you know, he, he, he took care of, uh, of animals or whatever. You don't look at me as a warrior physically, but he was courageous. Because you know why? 
He was the only righteous man alive. Think about that one. And God looked down and they saw Noah and he says, he's righteous. That's courage. That's courage. He was courageous before the ark. And that's why God chose him. He was the only righteous man on earth, as we said. Then God asked him to build a boat. It hadn't even rained, folks. They didn't know what that was. It was tropical. The way God watered the earth was from beneath. And so it hadn't even rained yet. And God said, I want you to build this boat 400 feet, like three stories high, huge. I don't know if God told him what it was going to be about. God said, it's, I'm going to, there's going to be a flood. It took this dude 100 years to build that boat, 120, I think, to build this thing. Now, think about the accusations. Think about what his family was probably saying to him. Think about all the things coming at him when he's building this boat. That stupid guy. A hundred years. But he had courage. He continued to do it. And the Bible says Noah did everything just as God commanded him. He didn't skip. He didn't try to take shortcuts. Everything God told to do. Courage is doing everything God tells you to do, whether you understand it or not. That's courage. Every person in this room this morning who knows Christ as Lord has been empowered with courage. You have courage. You just hadn't let it come up yet, some of you. You've got courage to do everything God tells you to do. What's holding us back? Well, let me just give you that. First of all, there's this, you're afraid of losing what you have. You're afraid of losing what you have. You hold on to things, right? We don't want to lose this car. We don't want to lose this house. We don't want to lose our family. We want to lose what we have. And so we don't make any moves, any faith steps because we're afraid. <laughs> I read John Maxwell. He says, strangely as it sounds, great leaders gain authority by giving it away. Jesus comes along and he says, look, the way to gain respect, the way to gain and be blessed is not go through life with your hands and your fist tight. You go through life like this. Give away. Don't be afraid. Another reason why we hold back and don't have courage is resistance to change. We don't like to change, do we? Nobody likes to change. Most people. We just want things the same the way they are. Nobel Prize winner John Steinbeck says, It is the nature of a man as he grows older to, prote to protest against change, particularly change for the better. So all of us older people, don't resist change. Don't resist it. Go after it. Let it happen. And then the last one is a lack of self-worth. We don't, we don't have courage. We hold back because we don't have this self-worth. John Maxwell says again, to those who have confidence, change is stimulus because they believe one person can make a difference and influence those around them. That's what I want to be. How about you? Charge ahead with courage. Stop procrastinating. Stop putting off. Charge ahead. We talk about living in the past a lot in churches. I've come to a different conclusion. Most of us don't live in the past. We live in the grief of the past. It's two different things. Don't live in the grief. See, God heals. 
God forgives. God restores, as we just said earlier. And that's what God wants to do today with your life. 2014, make up your mind today that it's the year of the promises of God in your life. Look for them. Go after them. Believe them. Speak them. Walk in them. Yes. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the negative. Walk in them and go for it. That dream, that vision, that hope, that thing that you desire to do, charge with courage, knowing that God is with you. Will you face some hard times? Maybe. So what? That's part of the journey. Just keep charging. Just keep going. The Bible says, For we who sow to the flesh will also reap a cor corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will, also, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart.